can you imagine this? You are a baby insect and you've just been born, well, hatched, so you've just hatched from your egg, and you are in a protective little cozy space full of the perfect food for you. Seeds of a yucca plant. We are talking about the yucca moth and yucca today. Hi, I'm Amy Landers with Gardens That Matter, where we help families create beautiful, bountiful gardens together. And it is Pollinator Week here at Gardens That Matter. It's actually been Pollinator Two Weeks. So last week we talked about pollinators, this week we're talking about pollinators, and on Friday we are going to cap it off with a free live workshop. It'll be an online workshop all about how to create your own pollinator paradise. So you, you will leave with a menu ready to pick and choose all the different pieces you need to create a garden that is just full of living things, full of bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, um, all of these pollinators that we welcome into our gardens because they're so important in our ecosystem. And some of them have developed these amazing relationships with plants. And a yucca and a yucca moth is a great example of this. So that yucca moth that was born, well, yucca caterpillar, <laughs> the yucca larva that hatched inside this nice cozy place filled with seeds, this arrangement is 40 million years in the making. Over time, these plants and these animals, yucca and yucca moth, have co-evolved so that they are a perfect fit for each other. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how, how they're a perfect fit for each other. We'll talk a little bit about growing yucca. And if you have any questions, pop them into the comments. Even if you're watching this um, later as a, as a recording, I will be back and I'll check the comments. And so I love to hear about what you're growing and hear your questions and I'll try to answer them either um, live or uh, after the fact. So let's get started. All right, so specifically today, the example I want to give you is um, yucca glauca, which is soapweed yucca, yucca glauca. And that is native um, all the way from New Mexico and Texas. How far north? Um, I didn't write down how far north, but it's, it's a desert and a prairie plant. So it's going to come up into the Great Plains. So Nebraska, Kansas, you'll find yucca glauca, soapweed yucca. Um, so this is a plant that grows in dry and semi-arid places. And then our moth, our yucca moth, it has a fun name. Let's see if I can say it. Oh, thanks for the love. Hi, tell me in the comments who's here. I can't see who you are. I, I missed that. So sometimes I can tell from the heart. <laughs> um, so the moth's name is Tegeticul, sorry, to get the, <laughs> if you've been watching this week and last week, you know, me and Latin names, sometimes we, you just have to say them with such conviction, right? I'm still practicing. Tegeticula, 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 Yuccacella, Tegeticula, Yuccacella. If you know better, you can tell me in the comments below. <laughs> so this yucca moth, Tegeticula, Yuccacella, um, is the moth that goes with this plant. And scientists, biologists, and ecologists have been studying yucca glauca, soapwood yucca, soapweed, soapwood yucca for, did I say soapweed earlier? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, soapwood, soapwood yucca. Yeah, 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 yeah. They also call it Spanish dagger. Anyway, we've been studying this since the 1870s. Sorry, let me just pause to say, if I seem a little scattered, it's because I am. My kids are off from preschool today, and we've been putting, trying to put together a tent. We're having a, putting it on the edge of our yard and garden space for them to play in. But there's missing pieces because they've been playing with it, the pieces all week. So I was like trying to put it together till the last minute. And then I'm like, oh, we're going to run inside. So my friend Hannah is watching them. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, and so here I am with you for a few minutes to talk yucca and yucca moth. So back to the task at hand. <laughs> we as humans have been studying this yucca for 140 years or so, since the 1870s. And as far as biologists know, this yucca moth is the only insect that pollinates this yucca. The only insect that pollinates yucca glauca is 
Tacaticula yuccasella. And the only, oh, go on, Ernie. My cat's coming in <laughs> to, to help us. The, now, only that moth pollinates that yucca, and this is the only food for that moth's larva. There's other species that are paired up like this too, right? So some yucca moths will visit multiple yuccas. In this case, this is a, a relationship that's a, a co-evolved, um, mutualistic, symbiotic relationship, right? These organisms depend on each other. Without one, the other wouldn't exist. And they are so deeply interconnected um, that they're a beautiful example of how we all are deeply interconnected with all the things around us. Like we are a part of nature, right? We are connected to nature and our gardens are the place where we really get to feel that and experience that and 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 take action in that, right? So what happens is every spring, the female and male adults hatch, they overwinter underground. So they'll, they'll hatch and crawl up on the ground and like, dry their wings and then they take flight and they mate. Then the female is ready to lay eggs and so she will visit yucca flowers and she'll visit quite a few and be collecting yucca and, or yucca pollen and she's packing it into a little ball. Pack, 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 pack and then she sticks it under her head and she'll carry it to another yucca where she will go into the flower and she'll actually drill a little hole into or to a uh, she probably uses her ovipositor. I actually don't know that little detail. How does she make the hole in the yucca? Good question. We can find that out. But she makes a little hole in the ovary of the yucca. And she puts her eggs in. Then she goes to the top of the reproductive part, the top of the ovary, so the stigma and the style. And she packs the pollen on there, which is going to pollinate that flower. Okay, so now the ovary has been pollinated and it will start to develop seeds. And at the same time, those eggs are developing and they'll hatch into larva. And now the larva have food to eat. They have these seeds in this nice, safe place. So inside the fruit, the seeds are developing and the larva are developing. And when the larva are ready, they will burrow out of the fruit um, and they will drop to the ground and burrow underground, they'll pupate and this whole cycle begins again the next spring. Then there's some really cool adaptations that make sure that this relationship continues to work. If a yucca gets too many larvae in that fruit so that there's not gonna be viable seed, right? Because the larva, there's a lot of seed in there, the larva can eat a lot of the seed, but if they ate all the seed, then the yucca wouldn't continue to survive, right? Well. There is a mechanism in that yucca ovary fruit that if there are too many larvae, it aborts that ovary. So bad news for those larvae, but the yucca is not spending energy putting, putting energy into creating seeds that will all get eaten, right? And then in turn, the moths have a mechanism to make sure that they don't put too many eggs into the same flower. After the female lays her eggs in the flower, she releases a pheromone, which is like a chemical signal. So um, moths are really sensitive to chemical like odors, but they're, they're not really odors that we can smell, but that is their, that's how they find mates. Um, and in this case, it's how they know that another moth has already laid eggs in that flower. So sometimes there'll be more than one moth that lays eggs in a flower. A flower could support quite a few larvae, or the fruit can support quite a few larvae. Um, but at some point, the moths know, like, there has been another moth here, or there have been several moths here, and so this is not a good fruit, a good flower, excuse me, for me to lay my eggs in. Because that fruit, if it gets too many larvae in it, will not develop, right? The plant will stop putting energy into that fruit. So how amazing that these animals and these plants, right, this, this yucca moth and the yucca glauca have developed over time together so that they just are a perfect fit. Um, and each one guarantees the continuance of the other, right, the existence of the other, the, the thriving of the other. So what does this mean in our own yards, right? Well, you can think about that 
you might have seen a yucca before, right? Especially if you live in the Midwest, if you live in the West, you will have seen a yucca, right? They're these beautiful evergreen spiky plants. Some of them get really tall, like you can think of like the Joshua trees. Those are, those are yuccas. Um, in this case, uh, the yucca glauca is a smaller yucca, so it gets to be maybe like, like, so, like maybe four feet, five feet wide. I'm kind of checking my notes. Um, I know it gets. It, I was thinking it. I was thinking I had three feet in my head because they send up a three foot flower stalk. So they can get like three, four, five feet in diameter. Three, four, five feet high. Three, four feet high. Then they send up a three foot flower stalk, and it's just covered with these white bell shaped flowers that are just perfect for the moth, right? But you may have a yucca, maybe even in your yard, and maybe you've never noticed this yucca moth. They fly at night, they're white, they're small, they aren't very like remarkable, so you might not even notice them. And so how many connections like this are happening in our gardens, in our forests, in our prairies, in our deserts, um, and we don't even know about them yet, right? Or maybe scientists know about them, but we haven't heard about them yet. How many of them are happening underground where we don't even see the interconnectedness in the soil food web, right? So you can start to kind of um, expand out from this idea of this yucca moth and the yucca and how vital they are to each other and how interconnected they are and expand out from there thinking about how we're all really interconnected that way. Because there's a lot of things that make it possible for us to live right here on earth and we make it possible for a lot of things to live as well. We're a part of nature, we are interconnected, and what an amazing thing to be able to strengthen those connections in your garden. By growing native plants, by encouraging pollinators, by creating habitat in your yard, right? Instead of a kind of lifeless yard of ornamental plants that like one after the other are all the same, um, shaped like a lollipop, what if you start to think about here's a group of plants that's going to support this type of pollinator and here's a group of plants that's going to support this type of pollinator and really creating this diversity, this rich habitat so that your yard is an even stronger link, an even stronger piece of this interconnectedness. That's really one of our goals with Gardens That Matter. We want you to be able to grow food but we also want you to think of your garden as part of this bigger picture because it's so much fun. It's so much fun to go out there and explore and to see what you can find. And if you have yuccas in your yard, who knows, maybe you can see a yucca moth. <laughs> go out at night with your flashlight, put some red um, fingernail polish on the end of it or like red cellophane so you kind of, doesn't mess up your night vision, right? And then go out and you can look for your yuccas. Now, if you live somewhere that's fairly dry and you want to grow yucca, what do you need to know? Well, yucca is pretty, going to be pretty straightforward and easy for you to grow. The big things to remember for yuccas are they need well-draining soil um, and they don't need a lot of nutrition and they are not going to like wet feet. So that's all connected, right? They um, have evolved in arid, semi-arid soils. So they're not super rich soils. They're not super wet soils. Um, and so they have adapted for that situation, right? They have these tough leathery leaves. They're pointy so things don't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they probably do a special kind of photosynthesis. I'm not 100% sure of this, but many desert plants have a special kind of photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis where they're actually conserving energy, right? Or conserving, excuse me, they're conserving water as they pull in energy to make sugars. So that is a topic for another broadcast. <laughs> what do you think? Should we have photosynthesis week? I don't know. We'll see. Maybe. Maybe we should have photosynthesis this week. Uh, but this week, Pollinator Week continues. Um, we will have three more pollinators midday each day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Friday night we'll cap it off with that workshop. I would love to see you then. Um, if you can't make it to the live workshop, go ahead and sign up because you'll get a link to watch the replay and there's a complimentary replay for 24 hours. All right, thanks so much. I'm gonna go out and see how they're doing. Maybe they found the tent parts that were missing uh, and we can finish the tent before nap time, perhaps. If not, we'll do the project later. <laughs> I hope you guys have a fantastic day and until I see you again, happy gardening.